Now we are joined for our global migration panel, which will be facilitated by Catherine Taktikin. She's part of the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Catherine is executive director, and, uh, which is a nationwide alliance that advocates for human rights of all migrants, regardless of their migration status. She's a daughter of an immigrant farm worker from the Philippines. Catherine was devoted for many years in grassroots organizing and advocacy in the Filipino community, and in 1986 was co-founder of the National Network. She is also a member and co-founder of the Global Coalition on Migration and the Women in Migration Network, both of which coalesce organizations and activists from the global regions towards international migrants' rights advocacy. She frequently speaks on a wide range of U.S and global migration policies, including migration concerns at the intersection of race, climate change, the environment, and gender. Please give it up for Catherine Taktikin and the panel on global migration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chinaka. Um, I'm so happy to be here um, to follow Adrian. That's a very hard thing to do, um, but in a very timely conference and for a very timely panel. So um, I'm honored to introduce um, our co-panelists here who, who, who are joining us. Um, and uh, again, just an, an honor to be on the same stage with them. So um, I would like to introduce Mamadou Goita. Mamadou is a development socio-economist and specialist in education and training systems. He is the executive director of the Institute for Research and Promotion of Alternatives and Development, or IRPAD. He works closely with farmers organizations in Africa and other continents and sits on numerous international boards. I know him um, as a leader of Pandemir, the Pan-African Network in Defense of Migrant Rights, and I believe I last saw him when he served as co-chair of the Civil Society Days of the Global Forum on Migration and Development in Marrakesh last December. I see him in cities all around the world, so I'm really happy to have to welcome him to Oakland. Um, and I would also like to introduce um, Berta. Um, Zuniga Cáceres, who is a social activist of Lenca descent from Honduras. She is the general coordinator of the Civic Council of Popular Organizations and Indigenous People of Honduras, or COPIN, a role she assumed following the murder of her mother, Berta Cáceres, an environmental activist and ind indigenous leader who was murdered in 2016. Um, we're so happy that she could join us to share more about the conditions in Honduras, a country that has very much been in the news here um, and has been a source of so many asylum seekers um, being denied access and justice at the U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you for joining us, Berta. <laughs> And I would also like to welcome um, and acknowledge um, Arlette Marisol uh, Hakon, Hakome, who will be uh, providing translation for Bertha. So um, to begin, uh, this panel on global migration challenges us to understand the right to stay, the right to move, and the right to belong. In our collective lifetime, we have known mass displacements of populations, people forced from their homes and homelands due to wars, violence, persistent poverty, all forms of persecution. Some have been welcomed into new homelands, some are falling into statelessness, and many face social, economic alienation and rejection. We have witnessed a change in who migrates. Today, half of all migrants are women. The proportion of refugees um, is even greater for women, and many children migrate by themselves or with their families. In recent years, the United Nations has acknowledged the growing phenomena of what's called large movements of forced migrants and the failure of most migration and refugee policies to address the needs of these populations to find safe passage and avenues for protection, to guarantee access to human rights, and to be included within societies. The crisis of climate change looms as an increasingly significant driver of forced migration as climate-related factors, whether due to slow or rapid onset climate change, exacerbates conditions for people who may already experience marginalization in their countries. Today, some 25 million people 
around the world are displaced due to climate-related factors. But within 30 years, experts believe that number could reach 250 million. So you can understand in that context the importance of what we're discussing here in this conference. Not surprisingly, countries like the United States, a major contributor to the conditions giving rise to global warming, are also host to persistent and rising xenophobia and white nationalism, and are most resistant to the recognition of migration as a climate adaptive strategy and to policies that provide safe passage and inclusion for displaced peoples, whether within countries, within regions, or across international borders. So our panelists um, are going to help us to better understand some of these underlying causes of displacement and migration. Um, and from that perspective, also share how we can contribute to policies of inclusion, as Adrian has done in her remarks prior to this panel. Um, so you've heard from Adrian, um, and I would actually like to first introduce um, Mamadou and invite him to share um, some, a few framing remarks from his position um, and experience as someone who has been uh, very embedded um, uh, not just in his, his home country of Mali, um, but in understanding uh, the uh, socioeconomic conditions um, uh, throughout Africa. So, Mamadou. Thank you, Kati, for giving me the floor. I'm so happy to be with all of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for this conference coming from Africa. I'm sure that when we talk about migration or immigration, migration, People are uh, just in mind all these boats uh, sinking in the borders of uh, Spain or Marseille. Many people dying, uh, women and young people and many children also in this trip. Uh, that is really um, killing, causing a lot of harm to Africa, preventing people from uh, uh, the perspectives that they have in the continent moving. Many young people are involved in this. Uh, some people are saying that uh, the flow is, is drying for this year because the statistics are showing that there is less people just uh, uh, dying in the sea for this last year. The flow is not dying. The flow is just the same. But the conditions have changed because many of these young people are dying in the Sahara. They are not getting access to the sea. Uh, this is why the, those who are getting to the other side of the sea are very few now, actually. If you look at the uh, geopolitics of this region, mainly the Sahel regions, you will see that uh, because of the uh, narrowing of the legal pathways, many young people just are crossing the Sahara, getting from, from Central Africa, because there are many people coming from Central Africa, mainly Cameroon, uh, DRC, and also Gabon, crossing the whole West Africa, coming to Mali, joining the north and going to Niger, probably, and they try to go to Libya and join the coast of Europe. But uh, there, are, there are many obstacles that they are meeting. The first thing is that there is a kind of externalization of the borders of Europe, because Niger has become uh, the police for all the young people moving from the Sahara today. There are four military bases in this country, two for migration and two for fight against terrorism. This is uh, what is the aim that they are having. If you look at, uh, there is, a, there is a, U, a U.S. drone base in Niger, there is a French military base in Niger, there is a German military base, and there is an Italian military base. The two last that I mentioned are there to prevent people to move. So just trying to avoid this uh, barrier that they are facing in Niger, many young people will just go and be uh, 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 hijacked by the uh, armed forces because you know that there is a, 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 a numerous group of uh, uh, terrorists, but also gangs that are operating in this region. So many of them are intercepted by them, forced to join the groups, or they have been killed on the way back. Because if you look at the routing from, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Morocco in the past, many young people were going to Lampedusa or going through uh, Ceuta and Melilla. That, that road, road was closed. Then we came to another one that is via uh, Mauritania. And you all know that being black in this country is also a problem even in the continent. So racism and xenophobia has been contributed also to block this road. And now people going to Niger are blocked because there is a hotspot 
that uh, doesn't tell the whole spot, as if you don't know, uh, stages where centers where, you know, detention centers where uh, people have to be, uh, to be questioned about the way that they want to go and how they are moving from Africa to other continent. So Niger, the case of Niger is, is, is very critical because it's disintegrating uh, West Africa because you have a free movement of people, but many pastoralist groups cannot move again uh, uh, there, and many of them then are trying to avoid this country and then dying in the Sahara. So the flow is not dying, but it's just because most of them are dying in the Sahara trying to avoid the normal routing. So you cannot access to visa, many of these people are going. So uh, uh, Katia has been emphasizing on some of the root causes. I will just give emphasize on one. How did you come to this kind of situation for Africa, mainly on the sub-Saharan African? It's because of some of the neoliberal policies that have been implemented in this part of the, of the country. From the uh, adjustment program that avoid to have just investment from the government, from the state, uh, on, on youth. Uh, many of them now unemployed, with no hope, uh, land grabbed by corporations, and the, ex uh, the, the mineral resources that are exploited ex ex extravagantly by many of these uh, companies, preventing the country to have access to resources to invest. So preventing them to go. So these are some of the root causes. And if you look at the uh, agreement between Senegal and European Union on fishing, many young people that are leaving Senegal today to go to Europe are fisher folks. They are artisanal fisher folks, and they are obliged to go. And if you ask them, they will say, we are following our fishes, because European countries have been exploiting the resources. And now that there is nothing to do in the country, these young people are obliged to go in Europe and look for better lives. So this is the case of Mali when we have gold production, but only 20% of the revenue of gold mm. is for the country. Mm. The 80% goes for corporations. So how can you invest in this youth that needs more investment, more employment, and to be able to stay in their own country? So in, inside uh, uh, this, all this, you can see that there is an external of borders, there is uh, economic problems that prevent people to go, and many of them are dying. The flow is not drying, but the flow is just the same, but many of them are dying before getting to the sea. So this is uh, something that I want to mention first, and then we can come back again. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, um, and, actually, and actually, what you described as some of the, the, uh, the, the, the issue of externalization of borders, um, as, as well as some of the inequities and the source of those inequities within Africa, we can also see, I think, within Central America. Um, so I actually just wanted to um, ask Berta to also um, share her experience in Honduras or within the region. Similarly, um, what are some of the, the conditions that people are facing there, and, and how does that impact the drive for people to actually leave the region? Sí, bueno, primeramente decir que me siento muy honrada de poder participar en esta conferencia y aportar desde nuestra lucha y nuestra realidad. So first I would like to say that I'm very honored to be part of this conference and to share my struggle and our struggle. Y bueno, también decirles que quisiera dedicar esta presentación a dos compañeras que trabajaron arduamente por democratizar mi país, Honduras, que han fallecido recientemente en un trágico accidente, eh, la compañera Ana Paula Hernández y también la compañera Sally O'Neill. And I would also like to say that I want to dedicate this presentation to two of my colleagues who uh, fought to help uh, democratize a lot of the um, systems in my country, and they are named Ana Paula Hernandez and Sally O'Neill. Bueno, eh, decirles que para nuestra organización, que es una organización que lucha eh, por los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, que lucha por la defensa de los territorios, eh, pues eh, el tema migratorio está muy relacionado con la situación económica y política que vive Honduras. And I want to say that um, the struggle of the organization that I'm a part of, which fights for environmental rights and indigenous rights, is very linked to migration. Y Honduras, a pesar de ser un país muy desconocido a nivel internacional, eh, ha sido puesto en el foco de los medios de comunicación y de la población a raíz de eh, las masivas caravanas migrantes que solo expresan la dura situación que tenemos en Honduras. 
And despite my country of Honduras being a very um, small country and not well known, it has become a spotlight for, um, for the media um, due to the large caravans that have been coming from my country. And that is just a testament to the difficult situation and conditions we're living in Honduras. Y que bueno, no son situaciones únicas de Honduras, sino que también se han reflejado en otros países, pero que se han expresado de manera muy aguda en nuestro, en, en, en nuestro país. And while many of these situations are not unique, they have expressed themselves in very um, deep ways. Bueno, yo creo que el primer elemento y que creo que compartimos en gran parte de Centroamérica tiene que ver con eh, la corrupción y la impunidad que enfrentamos en nuestro país, donde pues, grupos económicos y políticos están sumamente aliados y trabajan en beneficio de sus intereses. So one of the main reasons, which is something that is also occurring throughout Central America, is corruption, where we see several corrupt groups um, working together for their shared interest. Con el tema de la impunidad, decir que los crímenes cometidos en Honduras, que muchos tienen que ver con lacerar la vida de las personas, eh, hay un índice del 97% de la impunidad, incluso para los autores materiales de estos crímenes. And there's also the um, issue of impunity, um, which is a very big issue as well. And um, there is a rate of 97% of impunity for crimes in Honduras, including for the intellectual authors of these crimes. Y el crimen de Berta Cáceres también tiene que ver con eso, a pesar de ser conocido internacionalmente, hoy eh, hay una deuda con los autores intelectuales de su muerte. And as we know, there's also the case of Berta Cáceres, who's included in this rate of impunity, and there's a huge debt on behalf of the intellectual um, criminals who committed this crime. Bueno, el, el otro punto es obviamente la crisis económica y social. En una reciente encuesta de opinión a la población hondureña se ha preguntado cuáles son los principales factores por los que migra la población y pues los dos principales factores son pues cuestiones económicas y por cuestiones de problemas de seguridad. So the second issue is also um, the economic crisis in Honduras. There was recently a study that asked Hondurans why they are feeling they need to migrate. And the two top reasons were the economic crisis and the issue of security in the country. Y el tercer punto es la crisis eh, de inseguridad, de la crisis de seguridad que hay en nuestro país, eh, en el que las principales víctimas son las mujeres, los jóvenes y la niñez. And so the third reason for migration is the issue of security, where the prime victims are women, youth, and uh, young girls. Bueno, para nosotros una preocupación muy importante eh, es obviamente la política económica que ha impulsado el actual gobierno de Honduras, que está basada en el extractivismo. El 40% de nuestro territorio ha sido concesionado para empresas mineras, hidroeléctricas y otras, eh, de las que pues, la mayor parte de, la, de estas empresas tienen sede en Estados Unidos, Canadá y Europa. And right now we're also seeing that there's an issue of the um, economic policies that are allowing for extractivist policies um, in our country. Particularly, there are a lot of these companies in Honduras who are, um, their bases are in countries like the United States and Canada. Es una política que pone eh, el mercado por encima de los intereses eh, de los seres humanos, de la vida, eh, y que solo beneficia a pequeñas familias que forman parte de la oligarquía nacional. And so these kind of policies are prioritizing uh, market policies over human life, um, over human dignity, and are only beneficiating um, very few people who are usually the oligarchy in Honduras. Por eso la población hondureña, niños, niñas eh, y familias completas están viviendo casi un éxodo, eh, una crisis humanitaria que ha atraído pues, a muchas personas a cruzar de manera insegura, arriesgando su vida, eh, eh, toda esa travesía hacia Estados Unidos. And that is why we're seeing um, Honduran families, children, youth who are migrating from Honduras and who are putting their lives at this risky trip to come here. 
y eh, decir que pues, no es desconocido para esas personas esa situación, sin embargo, ante la violencia, ante la inseguridad eh, que se vive cotidianamente, pues las personas prefieren arriesgar eh, su vida a tener que pues, exponerse a casi una muerte segura. And so for these families and, and people who are migrating, the difficult journey is not unknown to them, but because they're living a daily violence, um, they would prefer to migrate than to stay where they know they will most likely die. Y bueno, decir que esta situación obviamente nos conecta con muchas otras realidades del sur global, Centroamérica, de África también, eh, porque esas son eh, algunas de las razones por las que se está migrando. Eh, y pues nosotros también creemos que podemos encontrar una respuesta internacional a esa situación, ya que para nosotros también es muy triste ver a nuestra población tener que marcharse. And so when we see these reasons, we see that they um, unite Central America and other parts of the world, such as Africa, um, and it gives us a reason to... Um, I'm so sorry. Sí, este que, eh, pues esa situación nos conecta con las otras realidades de África. Yeah, and, it, and these issues, they connect us with other uh, parts of the world. Y bueno, esa respuesta internacional tiene que ver obviamente con democratizar nuestros países, tiene que ver con la justicia social y ambiental y eh, pues tiene que ver con obviamente oportunidades reales eh, de un empleo justo y digno para las poblaciones. And so this would look like the answer, so the answer to these kinds of issues would look like a better democracy in our countries, a better social justice, environmental justice, opportunities for people, um, opportunities for a dignified job. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Bertha. So um, you, you've heard from Mamadou um, and Berta in particular talking about um, what some of the conditions are in their regions that are motivating factors for people to, to have to leave. Um, and we've also heard the president of this country refer to such people, both from Africa as coming from S-hole countries, mm -hmm. um, and we've heard about the invaders um, from Honduras and the other Central American countries. Um, we know that words matter. Um, and I wanted to come back to Adrian, who um, earlier, uh, as, as we were talking um, before we came on stage here, um, uh, she was telling me that in, in, in Canada, they actually don't use the word migrants. Um, and we've certainly heard when the word migrant was used in Europe, that it's meant in a very nasty and negative way. Um, but we knew these are the conditions, these are the people who are coming and why. Um, and uh, the terminology that's used to describe them certainly has impact. And I'm just wondering if you could reflect a little bit more about your thoughts on the words that we're using to describe people who are on the move and, and what impact that has. How does that contribute to public thinking about questions of inclusion? Well, that, you know, you phrased it extremely well. How does that influence the way people think? Language is everything. If you, you know, that's what is our part of our essential humanity, is our ability to communicate in words. And when we value words, they're important. And I think migrant for Canadians, I mean, now we're having, because we, you know, a lot of Canadians watch Fox News. Um, there, is the, there is seeping into our vocabulary where there never was before the idea of migrant. But it implies that you're just passing through a migrant. We expect you to leave again. And immigrant says, we welcome you in, we want you to be part of us. And we see immigrant as a noble term, which you in the United States have always seen before as a noble term. Okay, I want to remind you of that. And you've been a beacon for that in the world. Don't give it up and don't let anybody talk you out of it because it, you are a country of immigrants. You've been built by that and it's been your strength. And don't let that be beaten out of you because of all this other stuff that's happening. Immigrant is a noble thing. To be coming from immigrants is a noble thing. 
And you know, we in, at, at our uh, institute, we've been having this dictionary of terms that are used. And really, a migrant in practice is an underpaid industrial or agricultural worker who is expected to return to their home in the off season. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things. There's also the feeling it's patronizing and is, you know, when you fi finish picking our soft fruit, like strawberries, please go home. Um, and it's never self-applied. You never, some, nobody ever says, I am a migrant. They say, I am an immigrant, or I am the child of immigrants. They never say, I'm a child of a migrant. Migrant does not have a, it's not, uh, it's not the right word to let, uh, use, and I think it is very, very destroying to say, use that. An immigrant is a noble word, and the Americans, above all, should be the people that are promoting it and saying proudly, that there is such a thing as immigration and immigrants. It's also Europe's bogeyman, right? <laughs> the Europeans are a whole other thing that we're not there at this point to discuss that. Well, actually, I do want to talk about what's going on in Europe. So <laughs> I wanted to ask Mamadou, because you described um, this externalization of border security. We've all heard about Frontex and Fortress Europe. Um, these are the policies um, towards people outside of Europe, and I'm just wondering how you see um, that influencing how migrants, and frankly, they don't have immigrants in yeah. Europe, they, they consider them temporary and they only want them yeah. on a temporary yeah. basis. They don't want them as residents. But how does that influence how people are from Africa, from the continent of Africa, are included or rejected? Um, what is that? You know, what do you see, and what's the, the kind of the experience for the you know African diaspora mm. also that's in Europe? What is, how, how do they, uh, what's the experience that they're feeling in Europe because of that? Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I think that there is a need to just have an historical background on what is happening between Africa, particularly in Europe, because as you know, in in uh, 1884, Africa has been shared between European countries, in Germany divided because uh, for them to show that Africa was defeated, so they share it between countries. So this has created a kind of um, depredation of uh, resources, but also the kind of relationship that we have with European countries mainly, but also is extending now to other, other continent, that is um, continuously assisted countries. So when you push uh, the control of the movement of people out of, out of your continent. This is the case with La Valletta. There are some agreement that La Valletta is one with European countries in Africa, giving uh, some funding with conditionalities that you need to just prevent people to move. With the um, deportation programs, you know, return is forced return, but they are saying that is a voluntary return, but there is no voluntary return in all this program. So pushing back people, and Africa has a disadvantage first that most of it, those moving to these countries are uh, uh, facing racism and xenophobia. So already they are stigmatized, criminalized in all the ways. And the diaspora, that should contribute, that is contributing a lot in the culture, but also on the intellectual and all these uh, uh, scientific movement in Europe is completely uh, uh, stigmatized also because of the origin of these uh, people. So you have a double stigmatization uh, uh, because they are, they, are, they, are, they are black, because they are, they are Arabs, because they are Muslims in some of these cases. And, and secondly, because of the history between uh, uh, Europe and African countries also is playing part of a game. And there is exploitation of the resources because this continent is supposed to be the source of some of the resources that European countries are having. Just to give you an example, Niger is providing about 45% of the uh, uh, nuclear energy of, to France. Uh, but uh, this country, less than 20% of the population have access to energy. And uh, for the last 30 years, exploitation of uranium by Areva in this country, there are only 7% of the revenue that came to Niger. So the 93% has gone to the French companies. So uh, it, it's a double way of exploitation. And uh, diaspora is facing that problem. This is why African Union decided to have uh, diaspora as a sixth region of the continent. So we have five physical regions in the continent, east, south, central, and, and western. west. Uh, and then now we have uh, 
the sixth region that is the diaspora, just to say that we care about this diaspora, African diaspora, that need to be protected, the right to be protected, not sending money back home, but also sending all this double culture that they are facing and that the big we is that, that we need to promote in this kind of uh, relationship. Thank you. Um, and maybe if I can um, to, uh, ask Berta, um, just kind of looking at, at, at the phenomenon in, in, in another way, um, what your experience has been in hopefully experiencing maybe greater solidarity um, with the people of Honduras, um, I think especially um, when your mother was assassinated, um, it was an issue that um, uh, received, I, I think, a lot of empathy and shock and horror, but also support um, for the people of Honduras. Um, and it was an, a bit of an awakening about what the conditions are there. Um, and now with the, the, the Central American exodus and people moving towards the border, um, there has been resistance to terms like they're invaders, they're rapists, they're criminals. And I, I think we've certainly experienced um, people wanting to act in solidarity with people in Central America. And I'm just wondering what your experience has been over the last couple of years with how people are, you know, not just from the United States and Canada, but around the world um, reacting. What are the, do you get that sense of solidarity? Bueno, yo creo que han habido muchas experiencias, pero este, yo creo que lo esencial ha sido entender que nuestros países necesitan eh, justicia, necesitan también este, una eh, eh, justicia climática, que eso significa verdad, la protección de los territorios de las comunidades indígenas que están siendo despojados principalmente por empresas eh, de los países del norte global. So there are plenty of examples, but I think it's important to note that our countries need and deserve justice, especially um, environmental justice. There needs to be protection of indigenous people and of indigenous land, especially against the pillaging of our resources from companies that are part of the global north. Bueno, también decirles que eh, en un país donde la mayor parte de la población, sobre todo niños y niñas, mueren de enfermedades curables, tratables, se dedique el mismo presupuesto casi para la salud que para la seguridad, que es armas, uniformes e inteligencia, es algo verdaderamente penoso. And um, considering that in a country where most, a uh, lot of children are dying from preventable diseases, there is a need for aid and money um, to go to um, health instead of security, which would include um, funding for the military, funding for arms, um, it should go to health instead. Actualmente estamos promoviendo la ley Berta Cáceres por los derechos humanos aquí en Estados Unidos para cortar la ayuda que Estados Unidos provee en materia de seguridad hasta nuestro país, a nuestro país, hasta que no sean resueltos crímenes de asesinatos a defensores de derechos humanos y eh, defensores eh, del ambiente. And right now. And right now we're promoting the Berta Cáceres Act for um, Human Rights, which is to um, stop the aid from the United States to Honduras until crimes against human rights defenders are solved. Y bueno, este, yo creo que ante el el huir de esa violencia de nuestro país y encontrar en cada país por el que transitaban las caravanas migrantes, Guatemala, México y Estados Unidos, eh, gente que prohibía alimentación, espacios donde dormir eh, y que ha acompañado incluso legalmente a las personas migrantes para pedir eh, asilo político eh, aquí, ha sido de los gestos más admirables eh, y más que más nos han hermanado como humanidad en estos últimos meses. 
And I think um, as we've seen with the migrants who have been crossing um, to come to the United States, they've gone through Guatemala, they've gone through Mexico and then come to the United States. But we've seen that many people have provided food, have provided for a place to sleep and have also um, accompanied them, especially in um, asking for legal asylum. And seeing this and witnessing this is one of the most admirable uh, parts of these migrations. And that has also been able to bring us together as humanity. Thank you. Um, we actually have, I, I know, limited time for our panelists, but I, I really wanted to come back to each of them. Um, to ask for some reflections on um, what we might do now and what we might do long term, what can we aspire to do, um, that can address what we understand to be drivers of migration, a lot of what we often call root causes, um, but also what we can do um, to promote inclusion of people. Um, particularly those who are undocumented, um, who are forced to migrate, and unless you're going to um, retur forcibly return or deport them, they are going to be living in our communities, um, in our cities, in our, in, our, in our countries. So I wanted to come back to, I guess, each of you as maybe uh, to spend a, a couple of minutes maybe as some reflection and closing remarks about um, what can we do now? Um, and what do you think we can aspire to do? I think one of the most important things is that we not, you, you, you look at your own society and think, what has helped us to be the kind of place that we are, that we want to live in, that we want to bring our children and grandchildren up in? And I think Canada and the United States have this immigrant strength and power because immigration is transformational. An immigrant who comes to the United States or to Canada and then becomes American or Canadian is not the same person that he would have been or she would have been if she had stayed in Mali or in Hong Kong or whatever. I used to play a game with my father about what would have happened to us if the war had not thrown us out of our country. How would I have been different? And I think the, the wonderful strength of immigrant societies is their transformational capability because people are not the same. They escape from things like in India, they, they can escape from, if they've come from India, they can escape from the caste system. They can escape from all sorts of things that they didn't want to be part of. And they have the choice in a country, which they call new, to become something. And, and I think that is the becoming strength of the countries that we call the new countries, although in effect they are not that new because we have, in Canada, we have the oldest federation in the Western world uh, that has never changed its constitution. And since 1867, everybody else has. The French have had five constitutions in that time. And so I think that's what we have to think about is where is our strength? Also to not be afraid of people who have been thrown out of other places as though we would now have them and we would then throw them out because other people's rejects we don't want. Um, I think that is a great big mistake because I think ref, you know, people who come and realize that they have a chance to begin again can often do more than they ever could have where they were. And I think we have to understand that that is important. We've done studies where we've shown that immigrant entrepreneurs do, uh, immigrants are more likely uh, within seven years of starting their own business than native born Canadians. And these are facts that you see. Now there are many reasons for this. One is that they can't be, some of them could not be taken into regular things because they weren't wanted. And so they had to start their own kind of business. The other is that they just have that get up and go because they want to make it in a world which, has, which is not their own world. And I just had a wonderful example of this. I went to Calgary because I was there for, uh, for, uh, to, to, to do something for our own institute. And I had read that Aleppo, which was destroyed in Syria, right, that wonderful city, had great civilization. And one of the greatest things they have is something called Aleppo soap, which they've been making for a thousand years out of olive oil and bay leaves. And it's the best soap in the world because there's no animals in it. 
and they destroyed everything, the soap, and the soap disappeared from the European market, where I had been buying it since I was 21 years old when I went to France, and that for two years there wasn't any. And suddenly in the newspaper, the Globe and Mail in Canada, it said, Aleppo soap maker opens in Calgary, Alberta. And this was a band from Aleppo, who was a Syrian refugee, who decided to start up Aleppo Soap. And we went there and we bought a lot of soap, and he's now marketing it online. This kind of thing happens. And you know, we look at, if we listen to the rhetoric of the people who want to exclude, we are never going to get anywhere. Think of always the most, the, the, the people who want to, be, want to belong, who want to do everything in order to make the world a better place wherever they are. And that does, that's of every religion and every color. And listen to that. Yeah, for me, a couple of things. Uh, the first is that I just want to mention that uh, about 80% of the migration in Africa is intra-migration, so African going to other countries. So we need really to build more solidarity among uh, between countries, but also between continent. This is very, very important at that uh, stage that there are migrants are criminalized everywhere in all the continent, actually. This is what uh, I've been mentioning uh, so far. So there is, there is a need to share more information because I just realize all the time that I come to North Africa, America that uh, the migration situation, the deep causes, but also some of the trends are not well known. So we need really to create conditions to share information because this solidarity cannot, build, cannot be built if you don't know each other more deeply. And uh, this is why we are fighting within Panami. This is a Pan-African network in the defense of migrant rights, including just for African diaspora, but also in all the African regions, membership open with uh, trade unionists, the women groups, youth groups, and so on and so forth, just to fight for migrant rights. Mobility is a right, and we need to affirm it, to fight for it, and to defend it at any place and any time that we are. Yeah. So this is the key thing. And we have actually in African Union level two instruments that, will, that can give hope for us just to move forward. The first one is about the Agenda 2063. There is a, a component, a migration component, and the free movement of people in the continent will, will come to power very soon, in June probably. And then uh, this is an instrument that we need to promote in the continent, but also to, re to re rebuild our relationship with our continent. And globally, the GCM that has been negotiated, even though the U.S. have pulled out before the negotiations, I think it's an instrument that we can see the strength and try to elaborate more on this kind of solidarity between continent and solidarity between countries to see how we can move from this criminalization of migrants to a better openness, saying that today we are one world, so we have this big we that we need to build together. It cannot be done. If you don't know each other, it cannot be done if you don't have this uh, courage to engage fights against the stigma that uh, uh, all these community from the diaspora to those moving between countries are facing in all the continent today. Thanks. Bueno, decir que claramente cuando se piensa de políticas internacionales sobre el tema migrante, construir muros, sembrar el odio, eh, no es una política eficiente. Al contrario, este, pensarnos en cambiar las circunstancias que han hecho y han expulsado a tantas personas de su país debe ser la política internacional. Um, so when we look at international politics and when we see people who want to exclude migrants, who want to build borders, who want to create hate, we realize that it's not efficient and on the contrary we should be changing the circumstances of migrants so that they don't have to flee and they don't have to migrate at all. Y that should be a priority. Bueno, y un mensaje también a toda la, toda la población centroamericana y hondureña que se encuentra hoy aquí, es a no olvidarnos de nuestro país y a seguir luchando desde acá porque Honduras es el país que soñamos. And a message to all the Central Americans and Hondurans who are here, um, do not forget your country, keep fighting so that we can see the uh, Honduras we wish to see. Yes. Uh, we'll thank our panelists, please. Uh, thank um, our panelists for 
not only what they've contributed in their comments, but who they are and what they do every single day to promote inclusion and belonging.